kind of reiterate what uh, Naomi just said and thank all of you for attending. I know some for some of us it's in the morning, like Dr. Lustig and I, and for some of you it may be the start of the afternoon on the East Coast. And I even saw someone introduce themselves from Majorca earlier. So we've got some some folks from Europe um, also uh, dialing in. But this is uh, our first uh, Biosense Journeys expert Q&A webinar series where we discuss emerging science and innovation in metabolic health. And I know it's difficult to find time during the week, so we are very grateful that you're going to spend the next 45 or so minutes with us. We'll try to keep it short and impactful. Uh, my name is Carl Gless. I'm the head of product uh, at Readout Health. And before I introduce our exciting speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Lustig and the chief medical officer at Readout Health, Naomi Perella, I want to tell you a little bit more about Readout Health. We formed the company four years ago to deliver on the vision of creating impactful lifestyle changes by enabling consumers and patients to understand their personal metabolic responses to lifestyle choices. And today we have a bold mission to reverse obesity and type two diabetes as Biosense is the only FDA registered class one medical grade and clinically validated device that provides clinics and coaches with a full picture of how their patients fatburn levels change throughout the day based on diet, exercise and fasting. And we've learned over the course of this last four years that it's this personalized biofeedback in the form of ACEs, our proprietary biosense measurement, that is the key to driving behavioral change in a meaningful way. Uh, but with that, I'll introduce our speakers. I'll start with our guest speaker, Dr. Robert Lustig. Dr. Lustig is a professor of uh, pediatrics in the Division of Endocrinology at the University of California, San Francisco, and the author of Metabolical, the Lure of uh, the lies of processed food and nutrition. And I can tell you after reading that book, I know a few of us have that I, I suggest and encourage that everyone uh, check out that book if they have time. He's also the author of Modern Medicine uh, and Fat Chance, sorry, Modern Medicine and Fat Chance, Beating the Odds Against Sugar, Processed Food, Obesity, and Disease. Dr. Lustig has fostered a global discussion of metabolic health and nutrition, exposing some of the leading myths that underlie the current pandemic of diet-related disease. So again, we are very excited to have you here, Dr. Lustig. Thank you. My pleasure, Carl. <clears throat> and then uh, also, I'd like to introduce our moderator, Naomi Perella. Naomi is the Chief Medical Officer at Readout Health, as well as uh, Chief of Lifestyle Medicine and the Medical Director at Rush University's Center for Weight Loss. Well, thank you, Naomi. Thank you. I'm so excited about today. So, um, Dr. Lustig, Dr. Lustig, what a thrill to have you here joining us. Um, you're our very first expert, so thank you so much. I'm sure there will be a lot of bumps along the road, but um, for me anyways. Um, so, we want to hear your presentation, and at the end, we'll have time for some questions from the audience. And we've also collected hundreds of questions already from the participants who have registered prior. <laughs> yeah, so what I did was I just kind of clumped them into um, similar questions. And so right. we'll have some of those at the end. But yeah. otherwise, I'd like to um, just thank you for joining us. And um, I think I speak for many physicians who have uh, changed the way they practice medicine and the way we talk to our patients and understand the basis of disease around insulin resistance. So. I'm just gonna let everybody know in the next 45 minutes, we are going to talk about insulin resistance, uh, what factors contribute to insulin resistance, how can you know if you have insulin resistance, and what are some practical tips you can use to target insulin resistance. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Lustig. Well, thank, thank you, Naomi. Thank you, Carl. And it is my pleasure to be here. Naomi and I just spent a uh, wonderful two days in Racine, Wisconsin at an obesogen meeting, uh, which we can get into. But the one thing that came out of that meeting that I think everyone, uh, all 30 obesity scientists could agree on was that insulin's the bad guy in this story. That insulin not only drives the bus, but it flies the plane and actually goes to the moon. It is the single most important issue in both weight control and also chronic metabolic disease. And so focusing on insulin as a primary determinant of um, uh, weight loss therapy and also primary prevention of chronic metabolic disease makes an enormous amount of sense to the people who actually 
understand the problem. So with that, um, I uh, am going to share my screen. Uh, if I can find my talk, that is. There we go. There we go. And I need to um, uh, qualify uh, the title right off the bat. Um, the title of the talk is targ Targeting Insulin in Obesity, Not Just Insulin Resistance, because it turns out insulin resistance is just one of two primary problems of insulin. And in order to understand how insulin resistance works, you have to understand the second problem also. And that problem is called insulin hypersecretion. And that's a problem that virtually everyone has experienced it in terms of uh, clinical care, but no one understands because no one's looked for it. It's there, but if you don't look for it, you don't find it. And we're going to talk about that today. So uh, I need to uh, first, you know, advise you that I am a paid advisor to Readout Health. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about Biosense during this uh, talk. So, you know, no specific conflict of interest. On the other hand, you know, I do have these uh, disclosures to make. I did write these books for the general public. I am a chief medical officer for these four companies on the left and a paid advisor to these four companies on the right, of which Readout Health is one. Okay. So this was in the New York Times about six years ago now. This is a, uh, an article from Gina Collada. One weight loss approach fits all? No, not even close. We've been focused on the calorie hypothesis all these years. And the bottom line is it hasn't worked. And the reason it hasn't worked is because, well, number one, a calorie is not a calorie. And number two, different people have different problems, as we're going to talk about today. And number three, uh, we, uh, our food supply is basically screwed. And until we unscrew our food supply, don't expect anything to work. So we've got big problems, but we can at least start with understanding what the problem is. Because if you don't understand a problem, you can't fix a problem. And that's what we're going to try to do today. Now, one of the reasons we thought that it was all about weight loss and calories was this study. This was from 2009. Uh, Frank Sachs from Harvard is the first author. And what it looked at was a whole bunch of different diets. And you can see here we have 65% carbohydrate, you know, 15% fat and 55% carbohydrate and 25% fat and 45% carbohydrate and 40% fat and 35%. You, you see what I'm, you see what's going on here. Okay. Titrating the carbohydrate to fat ratio right here. Okay. And what you can see is that it doesn't matter whether it's all participants or participants who um, ha, uh, you know, made it all the way through, bottom line is they all clump together. And so everybody said, well, you see, it doesn't really matter what the fat to carbohydrate ratio is. However, if you look at this uh, uh, figure a little bit more closely, the point of it is that all of these um, uh, uh, whisker plots, they are all standard errors. Okay, standard errors of the mean. So the standard deviations are even wider because there are so many people in each of these groups. And <clears throat> what that means is that there are some people who are doing better on one diet and some people who are doing better on another diet. And of course, they all collapse into the mean and you're missing the point of the entire uh, uh, study, if that's the case. So knowing that, uh, there are many people now who are trying to use your personal biochemical profile in order to be able to promote both metabolic health and weight loss. The first of these was a study done by Zevi et al. from uh, Elenov's lab at, in Rehoboth, Israel at the Weizmann Institute. And they basically came out with a uh, uh, an artificial intelligence-driven personalized nutrition predictor based on glycemic responses from a continuous glucose monitor. And that then taught people what foods caused what problems for them based on serum glucose. Now, I think that glucose is important. And if I didn't think glucose is important, then I wouldn't be an advisor to Levels Health because they use this same concept for continuous glucose monitoring. The point is that 
insul- uh, uh, glucose is really just a proxy for insulin. And insulin is where we really need to go. And I will show you why insulin is so important as we go through this talk. So in order to understand the role of insulin, first you have to understand how the neuroendocrinology of energy balance works in the brain and, you know, with, and the inputs and outputs from the different organs. So in per, uh, blue here, we have four hormones, leptin, insulin, ghrelin, and peptide YY3 to 36. These are all afferent signals up to the brain. Okay, and they are telling the ventromedial hypothalamus the status of the uh, metabolic uh, situation uh, in in the peripheral tissues and also in the gut. Now, we're not going to spend very much time at all on ghrelin and peptide YY, other than to say that ghrelin is the hunger hormone. Okay, when you're hungry, your ghrelin levels go up, you eat, your ghrelin levels go down. That should be the end of the meal, right? Because that's the end of hunger, right? Well, turns out, Everyone can eat past hunger and routinely do. In fact, the end of hunger is not the end of the meal. What is the end of the meal is this uh, hormone here called peptide YY3-36. to It's found in the distal small intestine in the L cells of the ileum. And so there is a big uh, difference between the uh, stomach and the distal ileum in terms of distance, about 22 feet. And it takes time for the food to get from the stomach to the distal ileum. So the hunger hormone can go down, but if the satiety hormone has not been triggered, don't expect food intake to stop. And so that's why we always admonish our patients to wait 20 minutes before second portions so that they can actually get that peptide YY signal. And it will make a difference in terms of total food uh, consumed. Now, That's all I'm going to say about these minute-to-minute alimentary hormones. The rest of the talk is going to be centered on these two hormones, leptin and insulin. Now, leptin, as you know, is a hormone made by adipocytes, circulates in the bloodstream, goes to the hypothalamus, and tells the hypothalamus, hey, I've got enough energy on board to engage in expensive metabolic processes. I can burn energy at a normal rate. I can engage in puberty. I can engage in pregnancy because I have enough energy storage. It's like a servo mechanism, like the thermostat on your house. Okay, It'll click off when you reach a certain point. It'll click on when you reach a certain point. And so <clears throat> leptin tells your brain not how fat you are, but how thin you are. If leptin levels are low or if the leptin signal isn't being transduced at the level of the brain, your brain interprets that as starvation. And in the process, what it will do is it will turn off the um, uh, energy burning part of your nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, that is the sympathetic nervous system here in order to conserve energy at the adipocyte. And it will also turn on appetite via the vagus nerve. And that will also increase pancreatic insulin secretion. So that's our second hormone that we care about here, insulin. Now, you'll notice that insulin is not just sending a message to the hypothalamus. It is, but it's also sending a message to the adipocyte. So insulin does double duty, and the double duty it does is completely dichotomous, because what the insulin signal is telling the adipocyte is, hey, here's some energy, store it. And what it's telling the brain is, hey, I'm in the middle of metabolizing a meal. I don't need any more. Cut it out. So in the uh, periphery, insulin says store. And in the brain, insulin says stop. Exactly opposite of each other. So insulin is this very important um, uh, uh, bulwark in terms of uh, making uh, energy uh, appear in the periphery, but at the same time, limiting total food intake. And it is when this dichotomy breaks down that we actually get into the problem of obesity and chronic disease. And I will show you that as we go. So first, we have to understand what is going on at the fat cell. So the adipocyte is not this blob of jello sitting on your thighs looking bad. It 
makes hormones, and you can see all of the different hormones it makes, and it also responds to hormones here in orange. Now let's look at the hormones it responds to. Catecholamine, growth hormone, IGF-1, cortisol, sex hormones. These are all at least acutely lipolytic. They all cause energy to be removed or uh, released from adipocytes, thereby inducing at least temporary weight loss. Now, in the, for, uh, in the chronic situation, sex hormones and cortisol can do the opposite, and that's a talk for another day. But the hormone that is always consistently lipogenic, and it knows not one other thing to do, is insulin. Insulin always causes weight gain. Now, why does it do that? Well, it does it through five, count them, five separate mechanisms, okay? Sorry, I take it. Uh, yeah, five separate mechanisms. The first one, it increases GLUT4, which is the glucose transporter in the adipocyte that allows glucose to even enter the cell in the first place. It stimulates acetyl-CoA carboxylase 1, the first step on the way to fatty acid synthesis. It stimulates fatty acid synthase, the last step on the way to fatty acid synthesis. It stimulates lipoprotein lipase, which is that enzyme that sits on the uh, surface of the adipocyte and snarfs uh, lipid off the um, circulating LDL uh, molecules and VLDL molecules in order to pack it, you know, store them in the adipocyte. Okay, so uh, increased trend, uh, 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 lipid uh, partitioning. And perhaps most important for this talk, insulin works on the brain as well. And what it does is it suppresses lipolysis at the adipocyte by suppressing the sympathetic nervous system. Now, normally the sympathetic nervous system causes fat release. It causes you to expend uh, your fat uh, in order to provide energy for the rest of the body. This is why we exercise. This is why exercise can result in at least titular weight loss is because of the increase in sympathetic tone. In all in all, the effects of insulin decrease energy expenditure. They basically cause your fat cell to take up energy and they cause your muscles to actually reduce energy released. So insulin is basically a driver of weight gain. Now, this should not be too much of a shock for anyone. The question is, is it the pancreas's fault? Is it the liver's fault? Is it the muscle's fault? Or is it the adipocyte's fault that this is happening? Which comes first? The hyperinsulinism, that is the secretion, the insulin resistance, or the obesity? And the answer to that question is, depends on who you are, because everyone is different, not one size fits all. And that's why we have to talk about these different phenomena separately. In childhood obesity, and we now know in adult obesity as well, because we've done the studies for that as well, but I'm a pediatrician, so those are my slides. There are two insulin disorders, insulin resistance, and this phenomenon I mentioned at the beginning, insulin hypersecretion, and I will show you that in detail. Insulin resistance is due to a problem at the liver of the muscle. It causes defective insulin clearance. And as Naomi and I learned at this meeting in Racine last week, defective insulin clearance is a primary problem and actually an epigenetically controlled problem, which can be transmitted down uh, generations. Ultimately, this results in fasting hyperinsulinemia. You can see it in the fasting insulin level. And we see this in a majority of obese children, especially minorities. We also see it in a majority of obese adults, especially minorities. The second phenomenon is this phenomenon called insulin hypersecretion. Now, this is a vagus nerve-driven over-release of insulin from the beta cell in the pancreas. This does not result in fasting hyperinsulinemia. It results in postprandial hyperinsulinemia. The place I see this most is in children who have a hypothalamic insult, and I'll show you that later. So let's take each one in turn. Insulin resistance, the most common one, the one that most of your patients have. So everybody familiar with this phenomenon now? 
called acanthosis nigricans. You can see it on any extensor surface, back of the neck, uh, under the arms, back of the knees, um, uh, under the uh, breast cleavage, uh, all different places. When I was a medical student, there was one sentence in the pathology textbook about acanthosis nigricans. Uh, when I was a medical student, I never saw this, and now every patient has it. Okay, even the patients that aren't obese. That's a problem. Now, it is a sign of uh, 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 insulin working on the epidermal growth factor receptor of the skin. So when you see it, you know fasting insulin is high. So acanthosis nigricans is a marker for insulin resistance. But there are patients who are obese who don't have acanthosis nigricans, and there are patients who have acanthosis nigricans who are not obese. They overlap. And where they overlap, obesity and this phenomenon of insulin resistance, that's where you get metabolic syndrome, obesity and insulin resistance. Okay? You can have obesity without insulin resistance. You can have insulin resistance without obesity. Now, the factors contributing to insulin resistance are female greater than male, African-American and Hispanic greater than Caucasian, and pubertal greater than prepubertal. Now, what insulin resistance is, is it's a problem of either the muscle or the liver. And I will tell you that I think it's mostly the liver. All right. Uh, there are data to suggest that the muscle plays a role in this as well. But I actually think the muscles are along for the ride most of the time. But nonetheless, what we have is we have a problem at the level of the uh, of uh, uh, organs that should not store fat. Liver and muscle should not store fat. In the process, the pancreas has to make those organs work harder. This increases pancreatic insulin secretion as a reflex. But because the adipose tissue maintains its insulin sensitivity, that increased insulin at the adipose tissue will lead to, sorry, glucose disposal into that adipose tissue, driving obesity, and actually then increasing the vicious cycle. And children, of course, are the ones who are most affected. And the reason they're most effective is because they are consuming a substrate that drives this phenomenon in particular. And what is that uh, substrate? Well, it's this guy over here, fructose, the sweet molecule of sugar. So this is a schematized view of how a hepatocyte Consume, uh, uh, metabolizes fructose. First of all, only the hepatocyte has the GLUT5 transporter uh, that allows fructose to even enter the liver cell in the first place. When that fructose enters the liver cell, it is immediately phosphorylated to fructose 1-phosphate by the enzyme fructokinase. Rick Johnson at the University of Colorado, Denver, has transgenic animals where fructokinase is knocked out. And they are then protected both from fatty liver and from obesity and from chronic metabolic disease. And this may actually be a way of being able to treat obesity in, in the future, uh, is by basically by not allowing fructose to be metabolized. In any case, fructose 1-phosphate does several things. Number one, it all comes down to pyruvate, enters the mitochondria, overwhelms the tricarboxylic acid cycle, throws off citrate, which exits the mitochondria through a process known as the citrate shuttle. And then that citrate will act as substrate for this process here in orange, whoops, called uh, uh, de novo lipogenesis, DNL, new fat making. This is how you turn sugar into fat. The ultimate uh, 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 product of that is VLDL or serum triglyceride. And this is why when you eat sugar, your triglycerides go up. That triglyceride should then be exported out where it would then lead to obesity. However, not all of the triglyceride makes it out. Some of it precipitates in the liver as a lipid droplet. Now you have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In addition, this fatty acyl-CoA stimulates this enzyme here called C-Jun N-terminal kinase 1 or junk 1. And what that does is it renders the insulin receptor unresponsive. It causes hepatic insulin resistance. Thus, you can't even respond to your insulin signal. 
in the process. FOXO1, which is the uh, 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 transcription factor that prevents hepatic glucose output, is inhibited. You end up with increased gluconeogenesis, and you end up with hyperglycemia, thus uh, diabetes. In addition, uh, this uh, uh, fructose uh, uh, to fructose 1-phosphate uh, conversion at, at fructokinase will cause a diminution of the amount of ATP within the cell because you have to donate a phosphate. This will end up leading to an increase in the waste product uric acid, and uric acid inhibits nitric oxide synthase, thus increasing blood pressure. The sum total of which is that fructose through de novo, de novo lipogenesis, uh, inhibition of, um, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of FOXO1, and the increase in uric acid will end up leading to all of the symptoms and of uh, metabolic syndrome. In addition, we have learned that insulin blocks leptin signaling. So if, you, if your insulin's high, your brain can't see its leptin. And so what happens is you continue to consume. And so now you have a vicious cycle of consumption of sugar, metabolic dysfunction, and continued consumption, all leading to chronic metabolic disease. And of course, where is the sugar? Well, it's in everything. Um, you know, one third of the added sugar in our diet is in beverages. One sixth is in candy, cakes, ice cream, things you knew had sugar, um, you know, uh, but one half of the added sugar in our diet is in foods you didn't know had it, like, you know, breads, and, uh, 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 dairy desserts, and yo yogurt, other foods, um, uh, ketchup, condiments, etc. Here's an example. You'll notice these are the 10 worst children's cereals, okay? And you will notice Kellogg's Honey Smacks here, 56% sugar. No wonder they actually dissolve when the milk gets poured on them. It's because they're basically all sugar. Fruit Loops is the standard national school breakfast program breakfast. It is 41.4% sugar. And this is what we're giving our kids for breakfast. And I wrote this article many years ago now for The Guardian. Sugar is the alcohol of the child, yet we let it dominate the breakfast table. The reason I wrote this is because sugar and alcohol are metabolized the same way. And so it should not be surprising that children now get the diseases of alcohol, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, without consuming alcohol because they consume a substrate that does exactly the same thing. And when you look at what they're drinking, here's an example. Here's Berkeley Farms 1% low-fat milk, 130 calories, 15 grams of sugar, all lactose, milk sugar, perfectly fine. And here's Berkeley Farms 1% chocolate milk, 190 calories, 29 grams of sugar, second ingredient, high fructose corn syrup. This is even going on in infant foods. And you can see that they, the infant foods claim there's no added sugar, but in fact, 48 out of 200 of them actually said there was no added sugar, but they did have added sugar. Could this actually be the reason for obesity in six-month-olds? In fact, could this be the reason for obesity in newborns? Well, for the six-month-old, here we have lactose-free formula. Notice when they took the lactose out, they substituted with sucrose instead, 10.3% sugar. Turns out Coca-Cola is 10.5% sugar. It's a baby milkshake. Well, you could say, well, then mothers should breastfeed when they should breastfeed. But it turns out if she drank a 20 ounce Coca-Cola before she breastfed, there's fructose in the breast milk as well. And so, and that fructose contributes to increased weight, increased lean and fat mass. It grows the baby inappropriately at a time when growth is important, but you, you, know, you can overdo it. I wrote this, or, sorry, I edited this volume several years ago called Obesity Before Birth. And it turns out that high fructose during pregnancy will increase adipogenesis. And once you make an adipocyte, it wants to get filled. And this is what we learned at this uh, meeting uh, on obesogens is that developmental changes prior to um, uh, fat cell uh, 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 fixation, uh, prior to two years of age, 
can actually increase uh, adipocyte cell differentiation, uh, which will persist throughout life. And so keeping the obesogens at bay, of which fructose is, shall we say, the most common, is a major uh, consideration. Uh, in addition, uh, 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 placental uh, fructose transport from what mother ate will change the uh, structure of the placenta. As you can see, here's the decidua versus labyrinth in the control. And here's the decidua versus the labyrinth in the high fructose treated animals. You'll notice the fetal weights down placental weight is up. And when you look at, yeah, so labyrinth decidu uh, junction on decidua, you can see exact uh, uh, opposite. And that ends up leading to changes in fatty acid uh, uh, metabolism in the fetal liver. So SCD1 higher because of fructose, SRABP1, the transcription factor that drives de novo lipogenesis, higher with fructose than with glucose. UCP2, uncoupling protein 2, high with glucose, low with fructose. In other words, you are actually preventing the liver from being able to um, uh, uh, generate heat and thereby increasing the amount of adipose tissue and adipose tissue stored. So what does one do? Well, first one fixes the diet. What if that doesn't work? Or what if people won't fix their diet? Well, you still have to get the insulin down. You still have to fix the insulin resistance. The best medicine that we have, and it's not a great medicine, but the best one we have, and I used to use a lot of it when I was in charge of the obesity program here at UCSF, is metformin. Because most obese children are hyperinsulinemic and insulin resistant, because their problem is in their liver and metformin is targeted at the liver because it increases, sorry, it increases the enzyme AMP kinase. And AMP kinase is the fuel gauge on the liver cell. So if, uh, it, it decreases hepatic gluconeogenesis, increases hepatic AMP kinase, all of which are at least going in the right direction. So here's metformin here, activating AMP kinase changing SRABP1, which remember is the transcription factor that drives de novo lipogenesis. So if you stop de novo lipogenesis, you have a chance for fatty acid oxidation. In addition, you uh, 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 can decrease gluconeogenesis. So metformin at least acts in the right places. And we actually now have data that suggests that metformin is good for longevity. Uh, near Barzilai at Albert Einstein is studying metformin as a longevity producing agent. The reason it would do that is because it gets the insulin down. And anything that gets the insulin down increases longevity, as shown by Cynthia Kenyon's uh, C. elegans work with DAF2, which is the uh, uh, worm analog of insulin, and also Jim Johnson's work at uh, the University of British Columbia, where he uh, has a haplotype that expresses less insulin and the animals live 50% longer. So keeping insulin down is job one, and metformin does it. So metformin is not a bad choice if you're trying to fix insulin resistance, but it won't work if you don't change the diet. Here's what we showed in, uh, in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial in obese adolescents. So here's the change in BMI in the treated group versus the placebo group for one year, and then they came off the metformin, and you'll notice after that, they gained it all back. So it only works as long as you're taking it. It does not fix the problem. If you don't fix the food, you don't fix the problem. Metformin is temporizing. It's working because it's working on the right organ for the right reason, but it is only a temporizing measure. Having said that, you can do some pretty good work. Here's a patient who went on metformin for three years, um, age 13, his BMI is 47 and a half. And here he is three years later, his BMI is down to 31. And you can see he's a yellow belt in karate because he now has the energy to burn. Okay, that's insulin resistance. Now let's talk about the other problem called insulin hypersecretion. Now this is not well known. But it, again, uh, uh, goes to the point of insulin driving weight gain. 
So the old model was, well, you eat a high fat diet that leads to obesity. The obesity causes insulin resistance because of the insulin resistance, the pancreas has to put out more insulin so that the hyperinsulinemia is a result of the obesity. But could the hyperinsulinemia be the cause of the obesity? And in fact, that's one of the things we learned in Racine, you know, from Barbara Corky and several other of the uh, investigators there. Um, yes, hyperinsulinemia can drive obesity directly. And here's an example. This is a leptin deficient mouse, an OB mouse compared to its litter mate. Well, we have 14 leptin deficient people in the world, and they put out insulin like crazy. They're all of consanguineous marriages in the UK and Turkey. But I worked at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, many years ago, and I was presented with a cadre of 40, count them, 40 patients just like this. These are kids who survived their brain tumor, as this uh, patient in this slide did. He, this patient had a hypothalamic chiasmatic astrocytoma that required surgery and radiation. And once that occurred, he started gaining weight at the rate of um, uh, seven kilos per year nonstop to, uh, was it seven? No, I'm sorry, I take it back, 20 kilos per year to his current weight of 156 kilos. All right. Now, why does this happen? Well, the hypothalamus is in control of the autonomic nervous system. So when the hypothalamus can see the leptin being made by the adipocyte, remember the adipocyte releases leptin and leptin acts as a servo mechanism, okay, the same way as your uh, household thermostat. When the hypothalamus can see the leptin, it activates the sympathetic nervous system, first the locus ceruleus, then the intermediate lateral cell column to release norepinephrine bind to the beta-3 adrenergic receptor on the adipocyte and activate hormone-sensitive lipase, which will then cause lipolysis, triglyceride turning into free fatty acid. And that free fatty acid will then go to the liver and make ketones. And of course, that's what biosense will measure, is that conversion of triglyceride to free fatty acids to ketones. In addition, the hypothalamus will turn off the vagus nerve, will turn off the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, and thus you will reduce the amount of acetylcholine, which would, then, would normally bind to its M1 muscarinic receptor here on the adipocyte, which will then activate lipoprotein lipase and allow insulin to generate increased triglyceride. So you are turning on lipolysis and you are turning off lipogenesis when leptin is sufficient when the brain can see leptin. But these patients have damage to their hypothalamus. They can't see their leptin. And so their uh, sympathetic nervous system is down in the sewer and their vagus nerve is turned on and that increases adipocyte storage. In addition, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus being disinhibited will increase the amount of insulin released at the level of the beta cell. And it does it through three mechanisms. One, it binds to this M3 muscarinic receptor, which is coupled to the potassium ATP channel, thus increasing depolarization, thus increasing the uh, voltage-gated calcium channel widening, thus allowing for calcium influx and therefore insulin efflux. In addition, the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus activates this M3 receptor here, which is coupled to phospholipase C, which takes its substrate, phosphatidyl and acetyl pyrophosphate, down to its two components, diacylglycerol and inositol triphosphate. DAG activates the cascade for insulin release as well through calmodulin. And IP3 causes the um, uh, desequestration, the release of uh, intracellular calcium that's bound to the endoplasmic reticulum to be free in the cytosol, thus raising intracellular calcium and also causing vesicle extrusion, insulin release. And lastly, acetylcholine uh, being released from the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus will activate those same L cells that made PYY. They also make this other hormone, GLP-1, glucagon-like peptide 1, 
which then activates adenylcyclase, protein kinase A, and also causes insulin release. So in other words, the very long story is when you damage the hypothalamus, you get lots of insulin released and you get lots of adipocyte function to store it. So the question that plagued me when taking care of these patients at St. Jude is how can I reverse their obesity? How can I get their insulin down? Well, I had a medicine at my disposal called octreotide. Octreotide blocks insulin release at the level of the pancreas. It also blocks growth hormone release, but we were using it for its insulin suppressing effects. And so what we did was we gave eight patients in a pilot trial octreotide in order to try to suppress their insulin secretion. And lo and behold, when we did that, three patients lost lots of weight, two patients lost moderate amounts of weight, and three patients at least stabilized and didn't gain more. You can see here the change in BMI. Here's what their insulins did. Notice 300, 400, 500 micro units per mil. A normal insulin response to glucose should be about 100, okay, like this. And these patients were putting out boatloads of insulin. They were responding to the um, uh, glucose challenge in a big way. Well, after three months on the drug, you see it's starting to suppress. And by six months, we'd actually gotten their insulin back down to 100. And we noticed that the change in weight here on the x-axis correlated with the insulin suppression with the drug on the y-axis. In other words, if we got the insulin down, these patients lost weight. But something even more remarkable occurred. These patients started exercising spontaneously. There were eight patients in this um, uh, pilot trial. One patient became a competitive swimmer. Two kids started uh, lifting weights at home. One kid became the manager of his high school basketball team, running around collecting all the basketballs. These were kids who sat on the couch, ate Doritos, and slept. So we did a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, and this time we built a quality-of-life questionnaire into it. And you'll notice those who received octreotide suppressed their weight gain. Those who were on placebo didn't. And here's their insulin response. Notice we got rid of the whole first phase of insulin release with the drug, whereas placebo did nothing. Here's a patient, patient number one. Okay, And you'll notice 220 pounds pineal germinoma after one year on octreotide down to 172. And the apocryphal story on this patient was that she started being physically active within one week of taking the medication, even before the weight loss had occurred. So it wasn't because she had lost weight that she was active. It was because she was active because she was not releasing insulin anymore. Here's the competitive swimmer right here. BMI of 28, six months on drug, BMI down to 24. Okay, study was over. Insurance company wouldn't pay for it because it was not, you know, not approved. And here she is, you know, basically two years later, and her BMI has swollen to 34. And she's trying desperately to do something. We ended up getting her octreotide, and her BMI came back down to 27. And here's the proband patient I showed you in the first slide. Okay, 364 pounds down to 326. First time he took a picture with his shirt off. And this one is sort of the piece de resistance. This is the one that, you know, just blows everybody else out of the water. Here we have a young, beautiful 13-year-old girl from Hawaii. You notice the lily in her hair. And one month after this picture was taken in 2005, she was in a horrible car accident on H1 in Honolulu, taken to the Kaiser ICU unconscious for a month. And after she came to... This is what happened to her a year and a half later. Now, who here wants to tell me that this is gluttony and sloth? So I was giving grand rounds at Kaiser Honolulu, and they asked the patient and her mother to come to the talk. And there I am with her. And they went ahead and put her on octreotide. Remember, she didn't have a brain tumor, but she had hypothalamic dysfunction because of that um, uh, cranial trauma. And this is her one and a half years later at her high school graduation. 
So who wants to tell me this is about gluttony and sloth? Who wants to tell me this is about behavior? So how does this work? Well, here's the way to think about it. Each of us is really two compartments. There's you, your heart, your liver, your lungs, your brain, your muscles, your lean body mass, which burn energy. And then there's your fat, which stores it. Normally, these two compartments are in competition for every molecule of glucose. Which compartment gets the glucose? Well, th what determines that is your insulin. The lower your insulin, the more goes to you. The higher your insulin, the more goes to your fat. Now, normally, leptin would be released from your fat. Go to your hypothalamus, say, hey, I don't need so much. And that would then reduce the food, would reduce the glucose, and therefore reduce the insulin. And so that would be the normal yin-yang of energy balance that we are so familiar with. However, when these patients have CNS insults, like this patient did, the vagus nerve goes into overdrive because the brain can't see its leptin. That generates this increased insulin response, which generates increased partitioning of that glucose into fat driving continued weight gain. And the leptin can keep going up and up and up, and it doesn't matter because the hypothalamus is damaged. What we did was we gave octreotide to block that insulin release. Now, less glucose going to fat, more going to them, them feeling better, increasing their activity, increasing their exercise, and able to lose weight, despite the fact that the hypothalamus is still damaged. So you say, okay, that's great for these patients. What a great parlor trick for these you know, few individual kids with brain tumors. What about the rest of us? Well, here's an example. This is a patient I saw, six-year-old Iranian girl who was continuing to gain weight and BMI like crazy. And her parents were absolutely beside themselves. She was stealing kids' lunches in the first grade cafeteria of her elementary school. She was nonstop, uh, over hungry, had hyperphagia, and continued, and, and, and nothing could stop her, her. And she would cry for food in the middle of the night. So we did everything we could to change the diet. We did everything we could to try to make a difference. And this was what happened nothing, no improvements. Well, we then did an oral glucose tolerance test with simultaneous insulin levels on this patient. And you'll notice that her fasting insulin was a little high at 13, but not terrible. But take a look at her 15 minute insulin response, 203. I mean, this is like a friggin' skyrocket, okay? Just out of the blue, 15 minutes, okay? The glucose hadn't even gone up yet, right? This was vaguely driven. This patient had vaguely driven insulin hypersecretion. And you'll notice how quickly her insulin came back down. This is what was driving her food intake and her weight gain. So what we did was we put her on a very low carb diet in an attempt to try to stop the pancreas from releasing all that insulin. And you'll notice that when we did that, here's what her weight did and here's what her BMI did. We turned it around because we got the insulin down and we were able to get it down with diet, a very low carb diet. So here's how I want you to think about this. All right, here's obesity here. Here's leptin here. Now, normally leptin tells your brain you're not starving. And normally leptin extinguishes reward at the level of the reward center, the nu nucleus accumbens. However, Insulin blocks that leptin signaling. Insulin prevents leptin from telling the hypothalamus, I'm full. Therefore, the hypothalamus sees starvation. In addition, normally leptin suppresses reward, but the high insulin prevents that. And so you increase appetite because of increased reward. Then throw some stress on it from the amygdala, increasing cortisol, which drives insulin resistance. And now you have a toxic mix, okay? Between hunger, reward, and stress, you are driving insulin secretion and insulin resistance, generating hyperinsulinemia 
and therefore obesity and chronic metabolic disease. And worse yet, there seems to be no ability to turn it around unless you can get the insulin down. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we target insulin? Well, one way is metformin, but lifestyle is a whole lot better. And the problem, of course, is that our food is highly insulinogenic because this is the real food pyramid, which of course we've gotten rid of, but really we haven't because we're still eating carbohydrate like crazy. When our fat content went from 40 to 30%, that's when our obesity started to go haywire. All right, so what can you do about that? Well, you can get the insulin down by reducing this thing called glycemic index. Glycemic index basically is how high does your blood glucose, therefore your blood insulin, rise in response to 50 grams of carbohydrate in any given food. An example of a low glycemic index carbohydrate would be beans. Okay, And the reason is because they have amylose, not amylopectin. They have a low glycemic load. They also have lots of fiber. Carrots are high glycemic index, but low glycemic load because they have lots of fiber. So here's amylose. This is a, um, a string of glucose molecules with an alpha-1,4 linkage. Only two enzymes can work on this amylose at any given time on the ends, on the edges, working its way toward the center. Therefore, glucose does not get liberated rapidly, thereby keeping the insulin response down. On the other hand, amylopectin, which is what's in bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, it's alpha-1,4 linkages and also alpha-1,6 linkages. And that's why you get this branching, or this tree-like uh, 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 phenomenon. And multiple enzymes can then work on this enzyme at the same time. And therefore, you get a bigger glucose rise and therefore a bigger insulin response. Another way is fiber. Another way to stop it is fiber. So Fiber is 25% of the kernel when you actually measure it by weight. The problem is it's all been milled off. The way you can tell that it's been milled off is look at the total carbohydrate to fiber ratio on any given loaf of bread. And you will see that it is much higher than four to one. If it's higher than four to one, that means fiber has been removed. Because if the fiber hasn't been removed, it should be four to one. So why is fiber important in obesity? I like to tell patients when God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote. Fiber reduces the rate of intestinal carbohydrate absorption, thus reducing the insulin response. It increases the speed of transit of the intestinal contents to the ileum. That raises the peptide YY to induce satiety. It causes the production of short-chain fatty acids, which suppress insulin. And it also changes the intestinal microbiome to a less obesogenic bacterial um, uh, profile. It increases bacterial micro, uh, uh, diversity, microbiome diversity. So here's what carbohydrate restriction can do, which is good. As you can see here, lower glucose, therefore lower insulin. And here's what fiber can do, almost as good. These are on the same um, scales. Actually, no, sorry, these are not on the same scales. Apologize. Um, but you can see that fiber causes a significant reduction in the response, the glucose response. This is just showing that a low carbohydrate ketogenic diet can treat type 2 diabetes all by itself without any medicines. And of course, Verda Health and Readout Health uh, are all committed to using low carbohydrate modalities in order to be able to get the insulin down. Now, <clears throat> the last issue is physical activity. Now, everyone says exercise is essential for weight loss. Well, actually not. Exercise does not cause weight loss. What exercise does do is it causes muscle gain. Now, muscles have mitochondria, and that means the liver is getting less energy. That's good. That's the reason why it works. So, Cooper and Nemet showed that 12% of total energy expenditures physical activity will reduce fasting insulin by 10%. So by all means, engage in physical activity. The problem is that the peak beneficial effect only lasts 24 hours, and by two weeks, you're back to baseline. So <clears throat> this is an example 
<coughs> excuse me. This is an example of, shall we say, wrong thinking. Take a look at our current CDC obesity map. What's going on in Colorado? How come Colorado is less obese than the rest of the nation? By the way, Colorado used to have less than 5% obesity. Now they have 25% obesity. So something's still going wrong, but why is Colorado better than the rest of the country? And the answer is because there are four things that increase mitochondrial uh, function. Cold, that's why Colorado is less obese. Altitude, that's why Colorado is less obese. And then thyroid hormone and exercise. Okay, so exercise is good, but cold and altitude are better. So let's all move to Colorado because it'll get our mitochondria moving. Those of us who can't get to Colorado, better get your insulin down by changing your diet. Remember that diet is about weight. Exercise is about health. Diet is about pounds. Exercise is about inches. So in summary, insulin's the bad guy, but there are different insulin problems. Do you have insulin hypersecretion, driving obesity and thereby insulin resistance? Or do you have insulin resistance, thereby driving obesity, thereby driving insulin secretion, going the other direction? Or do you just have obesity, in which case, who knows what you have? The bottom line is, which comes first depends on the disease, and different people have different diseases. Therefore, different people need different treatments and need their insulin targeted in different ways. The way to determine that is the oral glucose tolerance test and the fasting insulin. So in conclusion, insulin should be a primary target of obesity therapy. Insulin resistance and insulin hypersecretion are two separate phenomena, but can overlap. Insulin responses can be used to predict treatment responses. Environmental changes that target insulin can be effective, especially food. And drugs have variable responses and a negative plateau, which limit their usefulness. However, at least metformin can work for insulin uh, resistance and octreotide, as I showed, can work for insulin hypersecretion. So with that, I'm going to thank all of my colleagues at UCSF at the uh, St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And with that, I'll close and I'll be happy to answer any questions that all of you might have. Wow, thank you so much. All right, so we got um, a lot of questions in the Q&A and I also put together some questions from prior. Um, one of the questions that seems to come up frequently is with regards to insulin resistance. You were talking about diet first and then something like metformin or other options. Right. With regards to taking action, how do you know if you're on the right track or what's a way for people to understand you know, where they're starting and that they're making progress? Right. So in my book, the most important single lab test is the fasting insulin. I think that everybody should have a fasting insulin at the same time they have their standard yearly metabolic uh, profile. Now, right now, fasting insulin is not on that. I think it should be. Now, why is it not? Well, the American Diabetes Association says, don't draw a fasting insulin. It's not good for anything. I say fasting insulin is the single best thing we've got. We are diametrically opposed to each other. And they are much bigger than I am. However, <laughs> I'm right and they're not. So here's why <laughs> we have this problem. The ADA says don't draw fasting insulin. And here are the two reasons they say that. And they're both specious and wrong. Number one, they say, don't draw fasting insulin because insulin assays across the country are not standardized. That's true. I do agree with that. They are not standardized. The reason they're not standardized is because some assays, especially the cheap ones, will pick up pro-insulin too. Pro-insulin is often released along with insulin. It didn't get cleaved by pro-hormone convertase one. And so you will, you know, to, you know, to insulin and C-peptide. And insulin, of course, is the active form. When the pancreas is under stress, it's going to release whatever it can. And it's not going to wait for that pro-hormone convertase one to 
cleave that bond. And so it's going to basically dump proinsulin into the blood as well. So you end up with hyperproinsulinemia. And that will show up on a standard insulin assay. And so the uh, ADA says, well, then why would you use it when you're not measuring what you want? That sounds commonsensical. Wrong. <laughs> That's wrong. And the answer is because if it's high, who cares? It doesn't matter. All right. Yes, it's true. It might be two species, not one. Who cares? It means you've got a problem and it's something you can follow. All right. And when it goes down, it means something good is happening. So that's prob issue number one. Issue number two, they say fasting insulin does not correlate with obesity. That is true. And the reason it doesn't correlate with obesity is because there are a lot of people who have insulin resistance who are not obese, who are normal weight. That is true. Okay. And there are also a lot of obese people who are not hyperinsulinemic because they have insulin hypersecretion. So their fasting insulin is low, but their postprandial is high, but you're only getting a fasting. So you're not learning, you know, you're not figuring that out from the fasting. All that is true. Point is that fasting insulin does not correlate with obesity. That is true. It correlates with metabolic health. The higher the fasting insulin, the more metabolically unhealthy you are, and the more you have to do something about it, or it will ultimately cause you to die of some chronic metabolic disease, whether it be fatty liver disease or type 2 diabetes or hypertension or uh, cardiovascular disease or cancer or dementia, because insulin drives all of those. So getting the insulin down is paramount. It is job one for all clinicians, all physicians. And you can't know if you're getting the insulin down if you didn't draw it. So that to me is where you start. And then what about, you know, people have to sort of have markers along the way in between appointments or some way of, you know, sometimes the scale doesn't change right away. You're doing all the right thing. Right. Um, and, you know, I'll commonly have patients complaining about, you know, I'm doing everything right, but the scale isn't budging as much as it should for all the effort I'm putting in. Um, what, what are your recommendations for individuals to know if they're actually on the right track along their journey? Well, so glucose will tell you. So the more you can keep your glucose stable, the more we know that your insulin will be down because insulin goes up as the glucose goes up. So it's one of the reasons why Levels Health has done as good as it has in terms of, you know, membership and in terms of being able to actually mitigate um, weight gain in a you know, significant percentage of their patients because they are monitoring their glucose, which is currently our best proxy for insulin. However, glucose is not enough. It's part of the equation. No argument. I'm for it but it's part of the equation. What are the other parts of the equation? What else do we have to monitor? Well, ketones, and that's where Biosense comes in because they will monitor ketones. Lactate, because it turns out lactate is a marker of mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, we do not have a good uh, uh, method for lactate measurement yet. Alcohol, and there are now, you know, grade A, um, you know, clinically approved alcohol breathalyzers. And finally, the one that I think is going to be the most important is insulin. And that's going to be a hard one because it's, you know, very low concentration and it's a peptide and it's going to be difficult. But we actually know what the technology is and people are working on it. It's probably about five years away. So we're not there yet. The point is that eventually we will be able to integrate all of these channels, all of these analytes into a general metabolic uh, reading that people can have in real time that will tell them exactly where they are, what they're doing, which foods did what, and how to basically, you know, get work themselves out of the maze they've found themselves in. We don't have that built today. But we do have glucose and we do have ketones. 
we do have levels and we do have readout. And so by looking at your ketone level, if your ketones are trace, even if you're not on a ketogenic diet, if your ketones are trace, that means your insulin's down. And if your insulin's down, that's a good thing. So you can use those two modalities, glucose and ketones together today to basically keep your insulin down on a minute to minute basis. Yeah. All right. Well, um, so we're finding that being able to use, for example, with the biosense and being able to dose the ketones, basically know how much ketones are you right. producing, gives us a really nice idea of how how much fat you're actually metabolizing. And um, that's been really helpful exactly. for weight loss in particular. So presumably helping with the insulin as well. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Now, we have some questions about, um, for example, fruit um, and the benefits of uh, fruit, you know, from some parties and then the concerns with the fructose, obviously. Right. So, you know, again, some people are asking, how do I know how much fruit I can have? Is there a marker I can look at? Is there some way that I could assess if I've had too much or too little? Right. Everybody wants to know about fruit. Yep. <laughs> it's it is by far and away the question I get asked the most. You must be against fruit. No, no, I'm not against fruit. Um, <clears throat> fruit comes with the poison, and it also comes with the antidote. Remember, when God made the poison, he packaged it with the antidote. I said that at the beginning, in, in the middle of the talk. The fiber in fruit so outweighs the amount of sugar in the fruit. And that's on purpose. God made it that way. And the reason is because that fiber is actually making that sugar not for you. It's for your bacteria. The fiber, and there, and there are two kinds of fiber, and fruit has both, soluble and insoluble. So soluble fiber is like pectins or inulin, like what holds jelly together. Insoluble fiber is cellulose, the stringy stuff in celery. Whole fruit has both. The two together form a gel, a lattice work, a fishnet, if you will, on the inside of your intestine. The cellulose forms the lattice work of the fishnet. The soluble fiber plug the holes in the fishnet. And together, they form a secondary impenetrable barrier that prevents early absorption of glucose, fructose, sucrose, simple starches from the gut into the bloodstream. If they don't reach the bloodstream, they don't reach the liver. If they don't reach the liver, they don't get turned into fat. They don't generate a glucose response. They don't generate an insulin response. They stay in the gut. And if you didn't generate it early, uh, uh, sorry, if you didn't absorb it early, that means they go further down the intestine. And what's in the second part of the intestine that's not in the first part? The bacteria. So the bacteria can't live in the first part because the pH hasn't changed yet. It's still pH one from the stomach acid. But as soon as you get past the ligament of trites, the pancreatic juices mix with the food, with the chyme, and the pH goes up to 7.4. And that's where the bacteria are. And they're calling for calories. And you need to feed your bacteria or your bacteria will feed on you. They will actually strip the mucin layer off your intestinal epithelial cells. And that will denude them and render them much more susceptible to leaky gut, irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and systemic inflammation. So keeping that bacteria working and, uh, and, and uh, impervious is essential which means you have to feed your bacteria to make them your friends instead of your enemies. Well, they're going to eat what you don't absorb. So if you can prevent its absorption early, you're helping your gut. You are improving gut health. Fruit has the fructose, which is bad if it gets into you, but it's really good if it gets into your bacteria. So keep it in your gut. Don't absorb it. Eat it with the requisite fiber. So fruit is good, but juice, because the fiber has been removed, is not. And so that's the thing to remember about fruit. 
And fruit is self-limiting because that fiber will generate that peptide YY signal. And so you will basically not overeat it. On the other hand, boy, oh boy, can you overdrink juice. Absolutely. Yeah. I found in my practice, it's been helpful using um, ketones or some measure that you can use at home to see how much it's kicking you out of your goal metabolic state, you know, being able to um, keep the ketones high or how long does it take to get back up or how much do you eat? And then it drops. Um, it gives it a, it, it makes it a little bit easier to kind of well, dose yourself on the amount of different uh, foods like that. Um, okay. So uh, another question that we had, are you okay on time? I'm fine until you're ready to kick me off. <laughs> All right, Carl, you're going to have to be the one that sort of calls the alarm when, um, when it's the right time. Um, so one of the questions there was, is, is there a difference in prioritizing best practices for treating insulin resistance at different ages? So we had tons of questions about pregnancy, postmenopausal time or perimenopause. Um, childhood, how to get children on board, et cetera. <laughs> that's, a lot. A lot of, <clears throat> that's a lot of questions at once, uh -huh. uh, to be sure. <clears throat> Certainly different paradigms will work at different age a, ages. For instance, it's really easy to control a kid's diet until you can't. Mm -hmm. All right. The biggest problem is that Parents don't control kids' diets because they don't control their own diets. Kids will eat whatever's in the house. And if the parents don't control what they're eating, don't expect the kid to control what they're eating. It, you know, as a pediatric endocrinologist, I always had two patients. I always had the kid and I also had the parent. And if I didn't fix the parent, I didn't fix the kid. It was an automatic. But <clears throat> the good news is that the kid will be responsive to the environment. So if you get rid of the Fruit Loops at breakfast, if you actually make the kids lunch instead of letting the kid eat the, the school lunch, because the school lunch is piss poor, and we actually have a nonprofit called Eat Real, where we're trying to get real food into K-12 to around the country. We're in three states in 500 schools right now doing just that. We got rid of um, 100,000 pounds of sugar from one school district in one year. Wow. Okay, by, by producing real food for kids to eat in that school district over the course of a year. It's really remarkable how, how much you know we can do. But if you, you know, if the kid's exposed, you know, what do you expect? So does that mean that the kid needs metformin? Well, if you can't fix it, maybe so. But the metformin is temporizing. Yes, it is addressing the problem, but in terms of the fatty liver and the you know hepatic insulin resistance. But as soon as you stop the metformin, if you haven't fixed the food, problem will be right back. So you know that's got limited utility to be to be sure. Other drugs for you know kids are highly problematic. You know, we don't have the, the data for most of them. Um, they're not really targeted at the problem. The problem is our, a societal problem. The problem is a cultural problem. And that's, you know, why I write books, you know, is to try to call people's attention to the problem. And I, you know, doing my best, but, you know, I'm up against a, uh, you know, 2000 pound gorilla, you know, and, and, you know, some days they're winning, and, you know, there are very few days when I get a, you know, a good shot in, but we, we do our best. Now, with respect to adults, obviously the longer the insulin resistance has been prevalent, has been, you know, uh, working, the harder it is to just, you know, reverse it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's a phenomenon that, you know, didn't come on in a minute. It's not going to go away in a minute. Yeah. Having said that, real food is the right answer. Real food works. Real food gets your insulin down. If you do real food and it doesn't work, and, or it doesn't work well enough, then the next maneuver should be a low carbohydrate, high fiber diet, okay? Whether you have to go full ketogenic or not is a question mark. I think there are some patients where that is true. You do need to go full ketogenic. I think in most cases, a low carbohydrate, high fiber diet 
which is really just real food, will work. And if that doesn't work, then what you need is an oral glucose tolerance test with insulin levels to see what's going on, to see whether or not you have this phenomenon of insulin hypersecretion. Because if that's the case, then you're going to need something that's going to basically affect the beta cell. Now, as you saw, the ketogenic diet in that, you know, in those patients where we, we tried that was effective. So that would be, you know, a thing to do. Other things that you could do, obviously, aside from metformin, <clears throat> are, you know, uh, 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 GLP-1 agonists. They are, you know, uh, readily available now. They do have the side effects of uh, increased risk for pancreatic cancer. So you have to be forewarned about that. But they do reduce food intake. They do ultimately improve your insulin profile. Um, and then, you know, if all, you know, else does not work, there is sleeve gastrectomy, which ha has been shown to be pretty good. Having said that, having said that, 35% of America are sugar addicted. And if you are sugar addicted, none of those will work. None of those will work. Not one maneuver will work if you are a sugar addict. And so the sugar addiction has to be dealt with as a primary therapeutic modality. There are ways to do that. I am an advisor to a company called Simplex Health that does exactly that. Um, if you uh, drink your calories, it doesn't matter if you've had a sleep gastrectomy. It's just that simple. What are your thoughts on intermittent fasting? You didn't mention that, and we've got a lot of interest, and we find that sure. really useful for so many people. Absolutely. So intermittent fasting works in some people. Again, depends on what the problem is. So intermittent fasting does not work in everybody. It works in some people. And I'm not against it. I'm for it. For those people. So the question is, who are those people? How do you figure out if you're one of those people? Well, the question is, why does intermittent fasting work? And the answer is it does work, but why? It works because it gives your liver a chance to burn off the fat that has accumulated in the last 16 hours. So if you're really good at laying down fat in your liver and you've got fatty liver, an intermittent fasting um, uh, eating pattern will give your liver the opportunity to try to metabolize some of that fat off. And over time, that will improve you know, the, the, the level of uh, intrahepatic fat, which will then improve insulin sensitivity and get the insulin down. And that's who intermittent fasting works for, is people with fatty liver disease, which happens to be 45% of the adult population. So there's a lot of people who intermittent fasting will work for. However, if you don't have fatty liver disease, will intermittent fasting work? And the answer is not very well. And the reason is because it's not targeted to the problem. So again, different strokes for different folks, because not everyone is the same. Everyone needs a personalized nutritional plan. We're working on that. We're working on the algorithm for being able to develop that personalized nutrition plan. And everyone's going to have to participate in their piece. But the biggest problem we have right now in the nutrition field is if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. So everybody's throwing, you know, they're throwing the, the you know, the bowl of spaghetti at the, at the, at the, you know, wall and seeing what sticks. And we need a much more comprehensive, you know, um, a studi studious um, uh, method for being able to figure out what's what. Having said that, the one thing, and I return to it time and again, the one thing I know, and I'll stake you know, the rest of my career on it, and I got validation just last week along with you, is insulin's the bad guy. Get the insulin down any way you can. 
definitely. We learned that last week uh, from multiple different sources. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Rob, I want to thank you so much for your time in answering a lot of these uh, many, many questions. As you know, I'm going to ask you more questions <laughs> later and in the future okay. anyways. Okay. Um, and we'd like to make sure that um, hopefully you'll be willing to come back again and join. Maybe next time I'll just start with a bunch of the questions that people have. Because, sure. like I said, there were hundreds of questions. So you're very popular and you know how to message. So uh, well, we appreciate that. I hope people got the message today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all attendees who've participated today or registered and had to leave early will receive a follow-up email offering first access to our beta Biosense Journeys program. It's really designed to use biomarker data, basically your breath right, to solve the problems associated with insulin resistance permanently. And this is based on all this work, you know, Rob, really, you've sort of uh, paved the way for us and taught us all in both clinical medicine research world uh, around the world about the importance of understanding the impact of insulin in our overall health and as the basis of chronic disease when it's dysregulated. So thank you for your service. The amount of uh, support you got through our uh, registration. People are very grateful for all that you've done and you continue to do to push this uh, field forward. So thank you. It's been my pleasure. Always, Naomi. All right. Thank you. Thank you everybody for participating. Carl, is there anything else we need? No, yeah, we just, uh, we appreciate your time, uh, Dr. Lustig, as always, as well as yours, Nia, uh, Dr. Perella. And uh, for all of those who attended, as uh, Dr. Perella mentioned, we'll be sending a follow-up email with recording. And for those that were not in attendance, we'll be sending out a recording as well. So thank you all for your time. And we apologize for going over. Um, always exciting and interesting discussion with uh, Dr. Lustig. <laughs>